You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Hi, my name is Janet Willis. Studying about God City, New Jerusalem, has been a treasure hunt. We've found evidence throughout Scripture that helps us picture our future home. But today, we'll look at one of the names for God that gives us a clue to the overall shape of His city. This is the sixth podcast of my series on the New Jerusalem. So let me briefly review. First, we looked at why a correct understanding of New Jerusalem is important. Then we looked at what the Bible says about its location, and we began to compare two visions of the future. Ezekiel saw a city that had remarkable similarities to the city John saw in Revelation 21 and 22. Then we dug into the details, looking at information about its overall shape. We saw how Throughout the Bible, God's abode is often referred to as a mountain. We gave evidence that the layout around Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus was a type of the layout of Ezekiel's holy allotment. And we saw that in the book of Hebrews, Mount Sinai was put forth as a type of New Jerusalem. Then we saw how Ezekiel in chapter 28 spoke of Eden as God's holy mountain. This indicates that the mountain-like city structure might have been in existence from the beginning of creation and was possibly visible to our antediluvian ancestors. Post-flood people groups all over the earth obviously had something that strongly motivated them to build man-made, massive man-made mountains or pyramids and their writings show that many thought of these structures as representing the dwelling place of their gods. That extra-biblical evidence seems to reinforce what Ezekiel revealed when he connected Eden with God's holy mountain. Now, in this podcast, we'll see how important information about the shape of New Jerusalem can also be gleaned from the study of one of the names for God. The Hebrew expression El Shaddai in the past, was usually translated Almighty. However, the theological wordbook of the Old Testament states, quote, The translation Almighty goes back to ancient times as at least as far back as the Septuagint, which translates Shaddai as all-powerful. In recent times, these earlier suggestions have been all but rejected, and new ones have been put in their place, The most widely accepted today is that Shaddai is to be connected with the Akkadian word mountain. End of quote. Thus, El Shaddai would translate into English something like El or God of the mountain, in other words, God's abode. This definition is a strong indication that God's city is pyramidal in shape. The most frequent use of this word is early in the historical record, pointing to the possibility that at least some of the antediluvian population knew about this pyramidal-shaped dwelling place of God. El Shaddai is the name by which God repeatedly identified himself early in biblical history. The book of Job, considered by some to be the oldest book in the Bible, uses the word Shaddai, mountain or mountain dweller, as a name for God 31 times. Nearly every person throughout the story of Job refers to God with this term. And at its conclusion, God identifies himself to Job by this name. In addition, still, very early in the biblical record, God said to Abraham, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. That's Genesis 17 verse 1. I'd like to read that again. If Abraham heard the term El Shaddai as God of the mountain, it would sound like this. God said to Abraham, I am God of the mountain. Walk before me and be blameless. Genesis 17.1 Then Isaac, when passing the covenant promises to Jacob, carefully communicates how 
God identified himself again as God of the mountain. If you don't mind, I'd like to translate all the next verses that have El Shaddai by using God of the mountain. Isaac said to Jacob, May God of the mountain bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. That's Genesis 28, 3. Then God spoke to Jacob with these words, I am God of the mountain. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will come from you, and kings will come from you. That's Genesis 35, 11. Then Jacob used this name three times. When he spoke to Joseph, Jacob said, God of the mountain appeared to me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. That's Genesis 48, 3. About 500 years later, when talking to Moses, God points back to this earlier age, saying, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name God of the mountain. Exodus 6, 3. In light of all this, the theory proposed gained strength concerning Eden and the antediluvian world. Since God chose to identify himself during the first millennia after the Noahic flood as God of the mountain, it seems likely that details about what God's dwelling place looked like were known to human inhabitants on the earth prior to the flood. This might also explain why Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's Hebrews 11:10. El Shaddai, as a name for God, also forms a significant word picture in other books of the Bible. David gives multiple references to God's home throughout Psalm 68. David first refers to the present location of God. He says, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. That's verse 5. As David then looks back into the past, he mentions God's presence on Sinai. He says, the earth quaked, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. That's verse 8. Then David gives a prophecy about a future appearance and location of the permanent dwelling place of God. David says, A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountain with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them, as at Sinai in holiness. That's verse 15 to 17. In this same psalm, David refers to the almighty Shaddai, or mountain dweller. He says, the God of the mountain scattered the kings. That's verse 14. And then David concludes by saying, Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, to the one who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times. That's verse 32 and 33. This phrase in Hebrew, the highest heavens which are from ancient times, literally means the heaven of heavens of old. Taken in context with the entire psalm, it's possible that the phrase could be referring to the holy mountain that was God's dwelling place, which was known to the ancient world. Thus, characteristics of God's abode are shown to be uniform from the past on into the future. Both Isaiah and Joel gave critical prophecies that connects this one known from ancient times as God of the mountain with an event that is to come. Joel says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. That's mountain dweller, Shaddai. This is in Joel 1.15 and Isaiah 13.6. The day of the Lord will come as judgment from the God of the mountain. That's pretty interesting. One final use of this word takes us one step further into the future. After the day of the Lord, God will set up his kingdom. In the opening chapters of his book, the prophet Ezekiel used this name for God, and then at the end of his book, he described a vision about that kingdom. In chapters 1 and 10, Ezekiel carefully described what he called the glory of God. 
along with fascinating details about the cherubim and the wheeled chariot with God on his throne. Ezekiel said the sound was like the voice of God of the mountain when he speaks. That's chapter 1, verse 24, and chapter 10, verse 5. Ezekiel then describes how he saw the glory of God, God's presence, leave the temple and even the city. That's chapter 10 and 11. Then in Ezekiel's closing chapters, he describes what God's coming kingdom capital will look like. He gives details about a structure on the south end of the holy allotment. He sees the glory of God, the God of the mountain, coming to a temple which is in the middle of this holy allotment. If that structure is New Jerusalem in the shape of a mountain, then we can visualize the following picture. The glory of God, God on his throne, will someday dwell with his immortal resurrected saints in his mountain that has descended upon earth. At specific times, the new moon and Sabbaths, he will come down from his mountain to meet with his mortal people in the temple. Thus, the paradise that was lost will be restored as all God's people, mortal and immortal, dwell with their God, God of the mountain. Our antediluvian past relates to our eschatological future. How about that for a mouthful? To summarize all of this, let me back up. First of all, I showed how the Hebrew name for God, El Shaddai, gave us important clues as to the shape of God's home. El Shaddai can be translated God of the mountain. Secondly, it was particularly important to see that this name was mostly used early in the biblical record. And third, it was also used in relation to the future. Ultimately, just think about it. What joy it will be to permanently dwell with our God, the Almighty, the God of the mountain. His city here on earth will be a visible manifestation of his love, his mercy for you and for me. So far in this series, we've been organizing the puzzle pieces to get a biblical view of New Jerusalem. We've looked at the location and the shape of the city. Details about the shape of God's city are in my fully illustrated article titled, Why New Jerusalem is Shaped Like a Mountain. That's in the Biblical Prophecy magazine published by Alan Kirshner's Eschatos Ministries. A link for the free online copy of this article is in the podcast notes. But to fully assemble the puzzle, the big question is the big question. If Ezekiel saw the same city John saw, do the measurements measure up? Oh, and what about the timing? When will New Jerusalem appear and descend to earth? There's lots more to come. Till then, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. 